Hello and welcome to this episode of Something Rhymes With Purple, the podcast about words and language and various musings from me, Susie Dent, and my co-host, Giles Brandreth. Uh, We've got some light relief today, Giles, haven't we? When you say light relief, we're going to be going into the world of pundemonium, because I love a pun. But first, I do sense you're looking particularly chilled this morning. There's a kind of pink suffusion across your face. Is is that because my screen is playing up as I look at you on Zoom? Do you know, I'm such a sucker for any cosmetic product that says gives you a glow and they never work. So I've resorted to other means and uh, you're right. I, I have got in front of me a Himalayan salt lamp. So this was a present from my sister and it is supposed to suffuse the room with calm, relaxing ionising perhaps little particles all the scientists listening will be banging their heads on the wall because I've described that extremely badly but if I start to nod off or if I enter a kind of state of complete zen in the middle of this podcast just keep talking I've got one of those and it drives me mad it puts up the blood pressure because I haven't worked out quite how to make it work you've got to put little things into it haven't you to create the infusion well, you just put Juicy these little salt. rocks, these little Himalayan oh, salt you, rocks. Oh. Himalayan salt is supposed to be incredibly um, oh, healing yeah. in so many different ways. But unfortunately, this has been sitting here for so long that I think the particles that are going to be drifting around are, are largely going to be dust. But I've decided to give it a go today because, honestly, you're not going to be happy with this. But I'm not sure I'm a really punny person. Really? Richard Whiteley, who I worked with on Countdown, the game show that I've worked on for a long time, he was the first and original host and was a huge lover of puns and I tend to groan whenever there's a pun and some some deliverers of puns like Tim Vine for example who's a British comedian who is probably the pun meister I would say in this country he hates it when people groan doesn't like it at all and a brilliant uh, producer one of our brilliant producers Lawrence has reminded me that Samuel Johnson called punning the lowest form of humour so I, I have a sort of very illustrious predecessor and not not quite being able to make their minds up although it sounds like he did about puns but Alfred Hitchcock said that puns are the highest form of literature Well, there you are. And it's a little bit of linguistic slapstick for me. I know they can be very, very clever, but I'm never very good with that sort of slapstick thing. But I think today you're going to convert me. So I no longer groan. I just sort of um, sit in awe and, uh, and listen with a big smile on my face. Well, I think groaning is part of it. But I have got a treat in store because I've been collecting some of Tim's choicest puns over the years. And I'm going to share some with you and with people who have tuned in from all over the world to listen to us. I mean, because in in my book, the reason I love puns is that pun power is at the heart of wordplay. Lots of dictionaries give slightly different variations on the definition of of a pun, but the one I looked up this morning was in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and they describe the pun, I think, nicely and concisely as a humorous way of using a word or phrase so that more than one meaning is suggested. And what I find fascinating is the paradox that lies behind them. The worse they are, somehow the better they are. Hmm. Let me give you one of my favourites. I think this is genius. What do you call a patronising confidence trickster coming down the stairs? What do you call a patronising confidence trickster coming down the stairs? You call him a condescending condescending. Ah, very, hey, very good. I like that. You see, like uh, I like um, the person who first described a kiss as elliptical, elliptical, the elliptical kiss, elliptical. So I'd like to share a, a pun with you about chemistry, but would it get the right reaction? So they come, they come in all shapes and sizes. And I have created for myself a kind of pun library, and this is the, one of the first ones I collected because I've been doing this since I was a boy. Puberty is a hair-raising experience. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's short and sharp. What but, about you know, these? These have yes, been around for such a long time. I mean, it's quite tempting to think of puns as being quite a modern phenomenon, but actually, I think if you look back to the texts of the ancients, you will find puns there. And I know a lot of linguists, including um, David Crystal, who we mention very often, thinks that English actually lends itself remarkably well to wordplay, as evidenced so much by Shakespeare, but particularly to um, to puns. Shall I quickly tell you where pun comes from, by the way? Please. It's, it's a kind of a humorous riff, I suppose, on punctilio. And punctilio is a fine or petty point of conduct or procedure. But here the, the um, emphasis is on the fine because it's a very nuanced, I suppose, bit of wordplay. I would argue that 
puns are very often not very nuanced. But anyway, that that is the origin of it. And it's also known as paranomasia, which comes from the Greek para meaning beside and onomasia meaning naming. Um, onomastics is the study of names. So that's where the, that's where the pun comes from. And uh, it's an art. It's an art. And, it, and you're right, it does have an ancient heritage. I mean, many of the literary giants of the past have been master punsters. Shakespeare revelled in puns. Yes. Ask for me tomorrow, says Mercutio, as he's about to die, and you shall find me a grave man. Mm. Another English, well, actually Irish playwright, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, punned his way into a lovely compliment addressed to a lovely girl called Miss Payne, uh, spelled P-A-Y-N-E. Tis true I am ill, but I cannot complain, for he never knew pleasure who never knew pain. It's quite nice, isn't it? It is uh, quite nice. Yeah, and I, I, lo- I love the fact that, especially with Shakespeare, it's a bit of a kind of word detection game because quite often his puns are very much based on the vocabulary of the time and the sort of double entendre of the time. So they're not always very obvious to modern ears, but if you do some unpacking, you realise just how clever they are. That's it. It is the cleverness of it. Hilaire Belloc wrote his own punning epitaph. When I am dead, I hope it may be said, his sins were scarlet but his books were red. (laughs) That is clever. Uh, There there was a headline, uh, Ernest Hemingway, when he died, uh, he'd he'd been known as Papa, Papa Hemingway, and one of the newspaper, it may have been the New York Times, uh, had a famous headline that simply read, Papa Passes, which was a a literary joke because Pippa Passes is a, a famous phrase, I think, from a poem by Robert Browning. So that really was... Quite ingenious. Oh, and newspaper headline writers. I mean, they rely on the pun, don't they, for their humour, and some of them are genius. Some of them are just um, slightly annoying. Um, in the Euros, of course, England are playing Germany, and I'm already dreading the puns that are going to appear for that. In fact, by the time this comes out, they'll probably have been and gone, but that, they always elicit the worst kind of puns, in my view. Some stand the test of time. In my pun collection, I have one from a novel written by Richard Hughes in 1938. The novel was called In Hazard, and this is the sentence. Presently, she told Dick she had a cat so smart that it first ate cheese and then breathed down the mouse holes with bated breath to entice the creatures out. Do you get it? Bated breath. Bated breath because it's the cheese which is the bait. Bated, if it's the cheese, is a bait. It's B-A-I. Mm, you have to know your English there. Yes. But baited, mm. to mean anticipating, is B-A-T-E. Well, baited actually, baited breath actually means uh, shortened breath. So you're kind of yeah. breathing quite uh, quite shallowly in expectation. So it's a shortening of abated. So so there's a wonderful pun, two different spellings in the same... I mean, this is, this is I mean, there, for me, there's a kind of erotic charge in this. That's a homophone, um, that one, isn't it, then, the baited? Yes. And a lot of puns rely on those. Homophone, homograph? Mm. What is a homophone? What is a homograph? Oh, homograph is a word that is spelled the same as another, but not necessarily pronounced the same, um, and usually Ooh. has come from a completely different route. So if you take bow, uh, to take a bow, and bow, oh, and bow, the bow that you might have in your hair, a homophone is uh, a word that has the same pronunciation as another, but again, different meaning, different origins or spelling. So new, as in new pair of shoes, and I knew that, for example. And then you have you have the homonym, which is not too far away, actually. So homonym is one of two or more words that has the same spelling or, or pronunciation, but different meanings and origins. So there's a whole collection there. And actually, they are quite often the bedrocks of puns, aren't they? They certainly are. I mean, let me give you an example here. And this is one of my favourites, because I think it could hardly be better, and it could also hardly be worse. It's the payoff to a famous story written by Bennett Cerf. And it's the story is about a private detective who is hired to trace a missing person named Ree, R-H-E-E. Mm-hmm. And this man, Ree, used to work for Life magazine, which was a hugely famous magazine in America, in New York. Eventually, the detective ran his man to ground and exclaimed, Ah, sweet Mr. Ree of life, at last I've found you. <laughs> Isn't that ingenious? Yeah, that is good. Yeah. I- I've actually made, I've got a pun notebook. I just keep reams of these. Uh, and I take part in a, a radio programme in the UK called Just a Minute. 
And one of the best puns I ever came across was was a, a riff from Marcus Brigstock. He did a thing telling us about the inflatable school, which had an inflatable headmaster and inflatable pupils. And one day an inflatable schoolboy came to the school with a pin. Mm -hmm. And the headmaster said to the schoolboy, uh, do you realise that you've let me down, you've let yourself down, <laughs> and worst of all, you've let the whole school down. Yeah, that's a famous joke, that one, isn't it? Is it is a famous joke, but yeah. isn't it clever? It's very clever. Uh, you see, I, I just, I, I love that. Um, and uh, do you know Milton Jones? Have you had have you uh, Milton, Jones Milton Jones? Is brilliant, yes, I've done a, I've done a radio is. show with he, him. And he almost does as many puns, I think, as Tim Vine. Hmm. It's one-liners, he throws them away. Years ago, I used to supply filofaxes to the mafia. Yes, I was involved in very organised crime. <laughs> You've got to admit that's ingenious. That's excellent, yeah. But the basis of it is a pun. I'll just give you a few of Tim Vines since you mentioned it. Okay, him. yes, So gosh. to give people who don't know about him uh, a flavour of what he does. Black Beauty? Now there's a dark horse. Uh, I took part in the sun tanning Olympics. I got a bronze. Uh, this bloke said to me, I'm going to chop off the bottom of one of your trouser legs and put it in the library. I thought, there's a turn up for the books. <laughs> You've got to admire the ingenuity of it, don't you think? You do. It's funny. Do you know what? The, the, but I, I'm just beginning to realise that actually what I needed was about 10 cups of coffee before this episode because my I woke up a little bit crumpsy today as in a little bit kind of... Uh, and this is a really good antidote for me. But the word that I tweeted as my word of the day was a giggle mug. And a giggle mug, this is not you, Giles, is someone who is perpetually cheery and only increases your bad mood because they're constantly sort of smiling and grinning. And I think in some ways the pun is the linguistic form of the giggle mug. In other words, it's constantly kind of happy and you have to be in the right state of mind. So I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Apologies if my reactions aren't um, as exuberant as they should be. But, um, yeah, the crumpsiness is going. It's working. Well, I think you're doing very well and I feel I probably am a giggle mug. Um, I and give I do you a know, giggle mug. I think puns are. Uh, giggle, giggle mug. Yes, um, mug and I think we call them. I think we call them punsters. Punsters, not, okay. I think. Yes. I think that's what they like to be called, not punners. Let me look this up. I think it is a punster because a punner is there in a very different sense of pun, which is to consolidate earth or rubble by pounding it. I love that. Ooh. Puns are kind of jokey puns, do sometimes pound you on the head, and then other ones are incredibly subtle, as you've shown. Um, I've got a list of some fantastic shop names, because I think no matter where our purple listeners are, they will have their own local shops, which have chosen some incredibly clever names. Well, um, should we do that? Should we tr have those as a treat after the break? OK, let's do that. I'll just give you a couple more to take us into it. I was neutral till a live wire promised me the earth. <laughs> That's Neat. good. The system of decimal notation has its points, but fractions are often vulgar. Very good. Quite nice. Mm. And finally, a Puritan is a person who knows what they like. Do you get it? Saying no, N-O-E-S. N-O-E-S? Yeah, no, say, I'm saying no. Person, oh. oh, for goodness sake. Oh, sorry, as in N-O-S, uh, as in nose. Uh, well, this is an example of your <gasps> homophone. It sounds the same, but it's spelt differently. Yeah, that's a really tough one. These are really subtle. Oh, these are. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, you're, you're with somebody who really is a little bit obsessive stuff. about this. <laughs> yeah, uh, nosy stuff. That's material you're talking <laughs> about. And you've got shop names. You see... Puns become memorable. I think people, when they name shops, want to give them ingenious names, like uh, the hairdresser locally here, which is called Curl Up and Die, um, oh, no. which is actually rather a grim name That's for a hairdresser, brilliant. isn't it? But the idea is you curl up and you die, D-I-Y-E. -I That's D -Y -E. brilliant. I've never heard that one. So is that in London? Yeah, that's, that's from very me. clever. OK, so I've got some more here and um, I absolutely love these. Uh, these. These are the ones that really tickle my fancy, actually. So I'm definitely getting there. OK, this is a locksmith in Portsmouth. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, I Sherlock love that. Sherlock Holmes. Um, and that's appropriate because Arthur Conan Doyle had a medical practice, the man who invented Sherlock Holmes, in Portsmouth. I wouldn't be surprised if this particular locksmith isn't around the corner from where Arthur Conan Doyle lived, oh, and that's what gave really them clever. the notion of calling yeah. it Sherlock Holmes. That's clever. Maybe there's a blue plaque nearby. Could be. Could well be, that inspired them. Yeah. Um, OK, this is a chain of kebab shops in Ireland. Abra Kebabra. <laughs> oh, that's genius. Um, and along the same uh, theme... A kebab van in Bristol, Jason Donovan. 
Now, you have to know <laughs> that there's a very successful series that was imported into Britain and possibly many other countries from Australia called Neighbours. And uh, one of the big stars was called Jason Donovan. So that's a joke on his name. This is an absolutely brilliant one, I think. A cocktail bar in Fulham, Tequila Mockingbird. Oh, it's wonderful. I love that one. I, I have to throw in something here because... Yeah. Uh, regular listeners do say to me, if I haven't done a name drop, I get a little tweet saying, not much main name dropping this week. <laughs> uh, but since you mentioned Jason Donovan, yeah. years ago when he was starring in, I think, Joseph and the his technical dream coat, the wonderful Andrew Lloyd Webber, Tim Rice musical at the London Palladium. Palladium, and yeah, I saw him there too. I saw him there and in his dressing room afterwards, he was changing and he introduced me to the possibilities of waxing. Uh -huh. Perhaps this is perhaps sharing too much, um, but I'm now uh, I'm not bronzed as he always was, but I do wax. Just sharing. Do you? Gosh, I would never have put you down for a waxer. Um, well, and are. it's very true, it's actually. Thanks, it's thanks to Jason Donovan. OK, I did I did a programme with Jason quite recently, actually, and he's just never ages. And he is incredibly smooth, you're right, so um, obviously he's still waxing well. You see, there, there are lots of possibilities for punning and waxing, you see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Waxing Jason Donovan. Oh, yes, exactly. His career goes on and on. So Jason Donovan waxes but never wanes. Uh -huh. That's instant Very punning. good. OK, so here are some tree surgeons in North London. Tree Go wise on. men. Uh, they should be in Ireland. Tree wise men. Anyway, uh, florist in Milton Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> back to the future. That is superb. It's said a Back to the Future, the film. You see, back you're to warming the to these puns now. I love this one. And a fish and chip shop in the Rhonda Valley, a fish called Rhonda. Uh, very good as well. And then you have to know about the film called A Fish Called Wanda. So sometimes you need to know your popular culture that's kind of underpinning these. But these are brilliant. And we would love to hear, wouldn't we, the, the sort of local punning shop names from, from our listeners because yes, there'll be some brilliant do. ones across the world. So please remember to email us. It's purple at something else.com and it's something without the G. Purple at something else.com. So please let us know and we'll definitely come back to them. Lots of people have been in touch uh, the advantage, of course, of easy origami is twofold. <laughs> I like that. I like that one. That's a good one. I yeah. think that's one of Tim Vine's. Uh, advent calendars, their days are numbered. <laughs> <laughs> Velcro, what a rip-off. <laughs> These are definitely Tim's, aren't they? They sound they very are Tim's. This is one of his most famous ones, and I think this is the one that maybe won an award at the Edinburgh Fringe as well. Conjunctivitis.com. That's a site for sore eyes. Yes. Yes. See, it's ingenious. So, please, if you've got a pun that you adore or even one that you hate, maybe we should maybe we should have a competition to find the world's worst ever pun. <laughs> and then we could give we could send them some of our merch uh, as a prize. What about the best and the worst? So, how about the best shop name and Great. the worst pun? We will be the judges and our decision is final. All right. <laughs> okay. Have you been asked this week? Susie, to talk about people mispronouncing words. There was a story in the newspaper the other day okay. based on a survey. 2,000 people were surveyed and 35% complained about the way some people say certain words. Hmm. Specifically instead mm -hmm. of specifically. Probably instead of probably. That's called haplology, yeah. yeah. What's it called? What's haplology. It called? Is... Oh, you mentioned that before. Yeah, yeah, when we swallow. Haplology, I'm going to yes. write that down. So haplology. things like um, uh, February, uh, secretary... It really annoys people. And so I, I assumed whenever I get a call to talk about the English language, I assume it's because your answer phone was on and they couldn't get through to you. <laughs> so they've come through to Giles instead. And so I've had so many calls this week saying, oh, will you come on and talk about people saying specially instead of especially? But I didn't know the answer to specially versus especially. Mm. I'd have thought that especially probably is allowed now. As always with these things, and I, I'm so boring about this, I think that, you know, these kind of arguments have been going on for a very, very long time. And so if I look, for example, this is not about pronunciation, but if I look at disinterested and uninterested or less and fewer and all those kind of big debates, you will always find that we've been having those for at least two centuries. So let me look up specially and see... Uh, for a special purpose, goes back to the 14th century. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is particularly, aren't we? Especially, yes. particularly, 14th century. There you go. Really? Yeah. So for people to be, if it's a mistake, people have been making it for 700 well, years. Well, yeah, and I wouldn't say it is a mistake, really. I'm going to look up especially now, principally, chiefly. That's later. 
for uh, 1400 So especially is correct. Well, no, I wouldn't say it's correct, but it's, well, it's as standard. Well, yeah, by maybe 60 years or so. And it's quite difficult to get it exactly right with written records. Can I tell you? At my age, sixty years actually makes a difference. <laughs> you I? know, you've got, you know, you've got sixty years more to go. Yeah, I, I probably, I probably haven't. I'm take, I'm, I'm waxing. I'm taking the tablets. <laughs> I've got the crystals in the corner of the room. I'm doing everything I can to get down there with the kids. Um, I've discovered this week the word lang for being beautiful. You're lang. I've not heard that. Yeah, it, it's you no. Know, oh, look okay, it up. Okay, my daughter look it up. keeps looking at me and making a sort of. Um, she puts her hand on her chin and she goes swag. And swag uh, oh, means cool. Oh, I think good. Swag. Well, I'm putting my hand on my chin too. Swag, 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 and Lang. And like, we better get to our correspondence. We are running out of time for our correspondence. Oh, oh Lord, correspondence, everybody. Yeah. What have we had this week? Ding, have you got the letters because I I haven't got them. You've got them in front of you. Yes. Uh, well, a nice email from Colin Campbell uh, referencing my using pofagged or powfag to mean tired out. He says my wife for decades has described the little bobbles that appear on a well worn jumper as powfags, and thus the jumper is powfagged. I guess it could still mean the jumper is tired out but she says she's never heard it used in that sense that's really interesting i hate those little bobbles i can never get you know my favorite jumpers i can never ever get get them off uh, so thank you colin for that colin's in devon so that's obviously again a specific dialect sense uh, which is really interesting um kate lang or liang sorry says hi susie and giles it's that time of year again and the weather can only be described as muggy can you tell me where this word comes from and i can kate's in bristol but it's not actually a particularly local word it's pretty much standard now and it comes from the mid 18th century but its roots are much much older because we think the vikings probably brought this one over and in their language of old norse mugga meant mist or drizzle so i suppose it's that idea of not so much the drizzle sense but the kind of humidity and the sort of stickiness mugga as in muggy yes um, what we also might call swallowing. Swallowing is kind of really sweltering um, with heat. So, yeah, it's uh, probably got its roots in a, in a Viking word. Um, Charlotte Godfrey I said, Dear Susie and Giles, one thing I find especially interesting is when the same word has completely different meanings or usages. I wanted to ask about the word try. Is this an instance of the English word having multiple origins or have the multiple meanings developed in English? So there's try in rugby, there's trying, as in she's been really trying today, you know, Know, a trial, an ordeal, or a test period, or that kind of thing. This is a perfect example of a good word for a pun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because, uh, you know, my wife is always saying to me, uh, are you trying? And I said, well, I, I may not be, but you are. <laughs> exactly. You know. um, well, there probably is actually a single origin behind all of this, which is an old French word probably brought in by the Normans, trier, which meant to sift. And if you hold on to that idea of sifting, you can see all its kind of metaphorical applications. So at a trial, a judge is sifting through the evidence to come to a conclusion. If you are trying to do something, you are putting it to the test and you're putting yourself to the test, you're testing it. Um, and in rugby, touching the ball down behind the opposing goal line, that's been called a try because it gives the scoring side the right to try to kick a, a goal. Uh, so that's where that one's from. And if you are being trying, as in your pun, Giles, then you are really putting someone to the test because you're being so annoying. You are testing the limits. Oh, very good. A term of trial. Megan has been in touch. Megan Tancock. And uh, Megan is asking, I was just wondering when to use sang and when to use sung for the past tense of the verb to sing. Oh, I sang at the concert. I sung at the concert. No, I sung at the concert doesn't sound right. No, I had sung um, at the con at the concert. So this is just a simple uh, distinction between the past sang, I sang in the shower, and the past participle, which is sung. So they're not really interchangeable. I sung this one yesterday would be considered non-standard, whereas I had sang is also incorrect or non-standard. But the reason I really... Um, I love this email from Megan as she says, I love the podcast and it's been a true oasis. And oasis is a word that I've used, haven't I, Giles? Because particularly during lockdown, it was a real refuge for me, the podcast, just something to look forward to every week when everything else had stopped. And it reminded me about the origin of Oasis, which is also lovely, because in the classical world, Oasis with a capital O was the name of a really fertile spot in the Libyan desert. 
and it comes from an uh, ancient Egyptian word for a dwelling place. Um, and then it came to be used for a place of calm in the midst of trouble or turmoil, which I love. Well, people listen to Something Rhymes with Purple to hear wonderful stuff from Susie about the origins of words. And occasionally they, they listen to hear the hot gossip that I'm able to bring to you. And I've got an exclusive now, which mm. I'm prompted to think about because of that uh, interesting question from Megan about sung and sang. This is about mentioned Noel Gallagher? No. no. Oh, what What have you... Oh, wait, no, I was just thinking Oasis, Get, sorry. I was oh, I see, going no. down that way. I was thinking, no. is, is there new goss? Is there new goss about Noel? <laughs> Not by Noel. No. This, is, uh, this will make you laugh or smile or maybe make you despair. I have been taking part in a television series, am taking part in a series, called Celebrity Gogglebox. Yeah. And I sit in front of my television with uh, my friend Maureen Lippman and we watch TV and they film us and then edited highlights appear at the end of the week. And it's, it's a great fun show to do. And as a result of this, I've been introduced to a program called Naked Attraction. And Naked Attraction is a TV show. It may appear in lots of countries, I don't know, but in the UK, it's been going for a few years now. And basically, it's a dating show, but you see the people naked. That's the point. And you choose them on the basis of whether you like the look of what they've got to offer. And it's got a kind of grim hypnotic effect on me. I'm completely hooked on it. And because I've said I'm hooked on it, I was invited this week to audition. No. As a, uh, no, 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 no. Oh. Not for Celebrity Naked Attraction. No, I, was I, say. I have declined that already, even, even though Maureen and I were briefly tempted. And I have been waxing for years, thanks to Jason Donovan. No. I was asked this week whether I would consider auditioning for a new show called Singing in the Shower. And the idea of this, it's like there's a successful thing called The Masked Singer and The Masked Dancer. This is a late night version and people will be in the shower singing. Uh, and that's what the show is. So what are you and saying? You're seeing Frosted Glass... <laughs> and a sort of vague figure behind it and then hearing their um, voice. At the beginning, but I think then the host, i.e. me, comes on, pulls open the You're shower the door, oh, thank God for rips that. back the okay. curtain. I haven't yet I haven't yet broached it with my wife because I'm in trouble with my wife already. Uh, because all sorts of reasons. Well, actually, because on this morning this week, we were asked uh, whether we wore underwear underneath our nightwear. Oh, yeah, that was a big because question, this, wasn't this, it? Mm. This is the big one. Obviously, the question of the hour. Mm. Most of the world is thinking about that. And I confessed that I think sleep is a time for freedom. Mm. And that, you know, uh, so going to bed in the nude is a good thing. I did add that, of course, my wife insists on the light being turned off first. Mm. She was not amused to be brought into the discussion at all. So I don't know that she's going to be encouraging me to take part in the auditions to possibly be Let the alone host. coming to watch. She won't be watching. I won't be watching. I will be glued. Absolutely. Well, singing in the we're, shower. Uh, yeah, I'm getting slightly Wonderful worried about here, John. steam rising, okay. the door Let's opening. move on. Shall we have my Out trio? Steps Jason Donovan. Yes, let's... Oh, I forgot. Oh, I thought we were coming to the end of the show. I'd forgotten about your trio. My trio okay. and your Let, poem. Um, I'll do a very short poem and you do a quick trio. OK, so I mentioned that I was feeling a little bit crumpsy this morning and you can absolutely see this is the case from the three words that I've chosen because I'm afraid they're all slightly... Ugh. So the first is puzzamus. Puzzamus. P-U-Z-Z-O-M-O-U-S. It means disgustingly obsequious. Oh, he's such a puzzlemous individual. I just oh, love the sound of that one. Um, fratchy, absolutely the same as synonym for crumpsy. If you are fratchy, you are short-tempered and quarrelsome. And this is possibly the worst. I can only apologise for this one. I think now, after all the puns and things, I would have chosen a slightly cheerier word. But I just, this is just, the fact that there is a word for this struck me as being slightly funny too. It's nidorosity, N I D O R. O-S-I-T-Y. It's absolutely disgusting. I apologise. Belching with the smell of undigested meat. <laughs> oh, good grief. I know. Someone's actually word. created a word for that. Nudorosity. 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 No, get oh, off the nudism. Nudorosity. <laughs> N-I-D-O-R-O-S-I-T-Y. No, it's a no more nudity, but how do you get the N-I-E-D into that? N-I-D. Oh, so it's not from the French need, uh, meaning a nest, so nothing to do yeah. with nest building, and everything to do with nidor, which is, I'm going to have to look this up, but I think that is Latin for possibly um, meat or belching. Hang on. Um, oh, rich, strong smell or fumes. There you go. Nidor. There you are. Yeah. So say the word again one last time. Nidorosity. 
I mean, when you right. ever can use it, but still, there's a, there's, a, there's a whiff of neederosity around here. Anyway, your poem. Very short, four lines. A little touch of Shakespeare, but in the modern idiom, because the world has changed. Fear no more the heat of the sun. The English summer has begun. There is a bank where on the wild thyme grows. You can't get money there. It's had to close. Oh, Midsummer Night's Dream on the bank where the wild thyme grows. Gorgeous. Um, well, thank you so much for listening to us. And um, just a reminder, please do get in touch because we love to hear from you. It's purple at something else.com. Something Rise With Purple is a Something Else production produced by Lawrence Bassett and Harriet Wells with additional production from Steve Ackerman, Ella McLeod, Paul Brogdon and just Mr Invisible, really. I don't know where he Gully, is. Gully, who's away auditioning, apparently, for a new show <laughs> called Singing in the Shower. Can't wait to open the door on him.